Well, it was last week. It was in the evening time. The family was at home in the kitchen. You notice how everybody ends up in the kitchen, right? One person was making dinner. Another was drawing something at the table. Someone else was appearing to do the dishes. Amen. Um, the news radio was on. Um, so in the backdrop, we were hearing the headlines of the day. So sexual harassment allegations, resignations, UN peacekeepers killed in the Congo, protests in Jerusalem. And then I was wondering to myself if as a mom of adolescence, I should have the news on at all, amen? When out of the blue, one of our daughters asked me, mom, what are you preaching on this Sunday? And I was shocked because you have to know, my children do not ask about my sermons, amen? <laughs> Why would they? They hear enough from me all week long. Nowhere in their cellular being is there a longing to hear a sneak preview of what it is I have to say by the grace of God. So it took me by surprise and I said, peace. This Sunday we're going to be talking about God's peace. And she said, gesturing towards the radio, well, it sounds like the world needs a lot of it. Amen? God. And a little child shall lead them. So though the Advent series and these worship themes, they've been scheduled for months, the Holy Spirit sort of clearly knew um, that this was a word perhaps we needed to hear. In light of world events, current directions, in light of what you may be experiencing within your own mind, within your own body, perhaps within your family dynamics, because a lot of families are getting together these times of, uh, this time of year, amen? So maybe it's at the home place or it's at the workplace, but we need to overhear a biblical conversation about God's peace today. Now, I have to acknowledge that speaking on peace is like trying to dig through a mountain with a spoon. Amen? Peace is one of those expansive words like hope, love, grace. That It may be comprised of a series of letters, but it holds within its hands a library of meaning. And peace, though it is broad and wide and deep, you know it when you find it. Or more accurately, when peace finds you. And you are definitely aware when it is absent. Can I get an amen? Therefore, peace is a state of being in your mind or body that releases fear and anxiety, minimizes cortisol and adrenaline. You could call it a calm or a serenity born of trust. Peace is also a politic. It stands for reconciliation over violence and hatred. It advocates for justice and equality rather than greed and privilege. Peace does not require agreement or even liking another person or another group. But peace does require a recognition of a common humanity born in the divine image, and a resolve to act on behalf of others instead of solely one's own interests or the bottom line. Thus, peace is experienced within oneself, within an individual, within relationships, among peoples and nations and neighbors, and of course, all of creation is affected, is impacted by peace, or the lack thereof. If you hone in, though, on our Christian tradition, peace sort of at its core is a promise of God. It's a promise of God. A promise that is simultaneously assured and experienced. We live in the tension of a peace that is visioned and a peace that is realized. Thus, with 10 years worth of sermons that one could preach on the many layers of peace, 
from mental health to foreign policy, we're going to choose today one simple trajectory. This is in keeping, remember our Advent theme, Advent is the day, are the days and the weeks and the worship and the prayer and the stillness and the quiet and the expectation that leads us up to the celebration of the birth of Christ. And our theme this Advent season is simple Christmas. So it's some attempt within the practices and the routine of your days to let go of some of the extra in order to hold fast to the center. And so in keeping with our Advent theme, we're going to have one simple focus regarding peace today. Are you ready? Amen. Here it is. Do not give up on peace. Do not give up on God's peace. With all that you see and know and hear and read, do not give up on God's peace. Keep praying and working and living and being open to the peace that is God's promise. A peace that is a future hope, but it also can be experienced now and in the today and in the here. So you hear about, and we heard about, two people in our scripture readings who live in this tension between a hope promised and a hope realized. So we heard from Isaiah in the Old Testament and Zechariah in the New now, you may know that Isaiah was a prophet who lived in the latter part of the 8th century. Um, he was an Israelite prophet. Um, and when he wrote this, the Israelite people were going through a particular world situation. The neighboring nation of Assyria had come into their land and conquered them. Um, and biblical historians, historians call this the Assyrian crisis. Can't you just see that scrolling across the Israelite screens? Amen. And so when Israel, when uh, Isaiah rather received this word from God, you have to know the situation that the Israelite people were in. Um, their way of life had been compromised um, from the language that they spoke to their ability to worship freely. Um, their daily freedoms were sort of stripped away because they were essentially living underneath a proxy dictatorship. And so the Israel, Israelites, they were desperate for some good news, for a light to dawn, for some of God's peace uh, within their souls and throughout their neighborhoods. And so Isaiah prophesied to them and with them that God would choose to wrap the world's hope for peace within the most fragile of packages within a child that would be born that would become a model a ruler um, an illustration in real life of the way of peace mighty god wonderful counselor the prince of peace now there were other contenders throughout the centuries as time marched on from isaiah's prophecy but within the Christian tradition, we choose to interpret that Isaiah's prophetic word came to fulfillment some 700 years later through the birth of Jesus. So just imagine for a moment, 700 years of not giving up on peace. 700 years of holding out the hope. Now this is why Zechariah was so animated in our scripture that we heard this morning. Zechariah, you may know, he was a priest of the, the house of Aaron, of the lineage of David. In fact, he was called upon some time to leave their Galilean neighborhood and to go in and um, attend to the temple in Jerusalem. So he had a particular purview of priestly duties. He was married to a woman named Elizabeth. Though they'd been married decades, they struggled with infertility. And they had not been able to sort of have their heart's desire, which was a child. And so an angel came to Zechariah and told him that Elizabeth, his wife, would be with child and that they would call him John. And he would be a part of this preparation for the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in this child's birth. 
<laughs> now, I don't know if you've ever read about Zechariah. Have you ever? I don't know if you've ever read that. But he says to the angel, he says, I don't think that's possible. How can this be? Because my wife, Elizabeth, is getting on in years. She's getting old. Do you know what the angel did? He was mute for her entire pregnancy. Amen? Unable to speak. Um, and then the first words we hear him say are what we heard in our scripture today. When John is born and he lays eyes upon this child who will have a pivotal role in preparing the way by asking people to break open their hearts, forgive their sins so that they could receive the peace that Christ was bringing. Um, and so he came to believe this because Mary, the mother of Jesus, was Elizabeth's cousin. So he was aware of all these miraculous events. And he came to believe that the fulfillment of that 700 year prophecy was coming into being through the birth of Jesus. So it was a promise of peace fulfilled, and yet, so it was already, but not yet. And then Jesus, he lived in to this promise of peace. And in particular, I want to highlight in John's gospel, when Jesus has, he's finished almost his um, three years of public ministry, he's about to leave his disciples and face the cross, and he says to them, this is what I promise that I will give to you. To all who believe in me, I promise you that I will give you my peace. It is my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. So one of the primary thing that the fulfillment of, pre, of, pe of peace, the Prince of Peace, gave to his followers was the promise of peace. And this peace, God's peace that Jesus gives, it's nothing that we can generate or manufacture. We don't live right enough in order to be good enough for God to give it to us. We ask for it and we wait upon it. It's as if Jesus essentially said to his followers, in order for you to work toward outward peace, I know you need to experience a measure of inward peace. I need you to uphold the light into an often shadowy world. And so I am going to give you a peace that the world can't give. But you have to receive it in order to even have it to give away. And I wonder among us this morning, have you ever experienced that kind of peace? Have you, have you ever experienced God's peace? A measure of it. It is a peace that passes understanding, that transcends circumstances. Experiencing the peace of Christ, it doesn't mean that, that suddenly all anxiety or worry or concern is just banished from our minds or, or our bodies, but there is a, as an abiding sense. It also doesn't mean that we are anesthetized from action in the name of keeping the peace. God's peace, rather, is liberating. It's motivating because it's a peace that is born of trust that something besides us or decisions we've made or not made or other people stand at the center of the universe and that God holds the past, is with us now, and extends and holds into the future. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Sometimes though, living peaceably in the world, it is an incredible challenge. Can I get an amen? I mean to tell you, I think that I'm a peace-loving person and then somebody cuts me off in traffic. Just something as simple as that. And there is a depth of rage that emerges that I did not know was there. And I thought, my gosh, Lord Jesus, you are not done with me yet. Because if I feel this, that someone cut me off from traffic, you have got a lot of work to do, Lord God. Sometimes living peaceably, it's an incredible challenge. People hurt those whom we love or have wronged us. One of the greatest temptations that we can face 
is to become worn down and begin to give up on peace. Think that working towards peace is impossible, naive, impractical, and goodness isn't it inefficient. Amen? For the Christian, the opposite of peace is not merely conflict or war. It is cynicism and apathy. That's great on paper, but it's not the way the world works, we may say. How can I have peace when there is so much to worry about, we may think. Who am I to change systems or structures? I am but a drop in the ocean. But of course, Mother Teresa reminds us that the ocean is made up of drops. Amen. We remember that we march to the tune of not just another drum, but a whole nother drummer. Amen. My peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Accept my peace and my ways and then Jesus says, do not give up on peace. Because when we look around in the world, we know that we very much continue to live, as did Isaiah, as did Zechariah, within the tension of a peace that is here and available, but also a peace that is not fully realized. And we see, and at times can feel overwhelmed by the brokenness of the world. One of our main goals, I think, as people of faith, is to hold the banner of peace and to not give up. I heard an interview this week um, with a diplomat, Dennis Ross, He's been involved in the Middle East peace negotiations under Presidents George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Um, so he has been involved in this process in a bipartisan fashion. And of course, he was being interviewed in the news because of President Trump's decision to move the American embassy to Jerusalem and what concerns um, this raises um, due to that peace process. And so the interview asked um, diplomat Ross, Essentially, she said, you know, after now having worked with five presidents, how do you keep going? How do you keep doing this work? And this is what he said. He said, well, as someone who has worked on this for a very long time, almost by definition, I never give up hope. Because I think the minute you give up hope, you doom the possibility of ever being able to reach peace. Amen? Don't give up. And he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I spoke with a friend a couple of months ago. She has, um, since her growing up years, had a strained relationship with her father. And it grew more difficult when her parents um, had a divorce, a very painful divorce after 40 years of being, marriage, of being married, having their marriage. Um, she felt like just for years and years, she's tried to sort of have a relationship with her father. Um, and it just doesn't happen. He doesn't put forth the effort. She has adjusted her expectations, protected herself. We talked about Romans 12, 18, and it says this. If it is possible... So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. <laughs> that we cannot control what other people do, amen, and the decisions that they make. But we are respons responsible for our end and for seeking to live with respect and integrity without being a doormat. That is the tension that the Holy Spirit helps us walk. So after a recent incident where she tried to reach out to her father again and he just did not reciprocate, she called me and she said, why do I even try to have a relationship with this man? He will never change. He is stubborn and irrational. I'm done. I'm done hoping. And I just listened. I didn't say anything. A couple weeks later, though, we talked again. And I brought it up. I said, how are you doing? And she said, you know, after our last conversation, I just sat with the possibility of giving up on a greater peace within my relationship with my father. 
And I said, I'm done. And she said, what opened up felt to me like a very deep abyss. Sort of a very dark place. And she said, as I thought about it, I said that what it seemed like was less like giving up on a relationship and more like giving up on God's transforming possibilities. She said that God could still transform him. She said that through clenched teeth, by the way. And she said, God could still transform me. So I'm going to keep giving this relationship to God and keep reaching out. And we'll see what God does with it. Don't give up on peace. Right now in your life, you may have a place that is in need of peace. Maybe it's a struggle in your own mind, in your family, within a relationship, a larger social issue to which you feel called. Don't give up on God's peace to transform this situation. Even if you need to take a step back and have someone else keep the prayer pit vigil, amen? Even when it seems like it's a very small light against a very great shadow, Keep shining, for a child has been born to us, and authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And his authority shall grow continually, and there shall be, one day, a world of endless peace. Let us pray.